According to a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Allah created Adam as a duplicate of himself. Narrated Abu Hurairah, Muhammad said, Allah created Adam in his complete shape and form, 60 cubits, about 30 meters, in height. In spite of statements like this littered throughout Islam's authoritative sources, many people think the Islamic deity is a supratemporal, spaceless, and immaterial being. However, this popular but fault-ridden idea has nothing to do with what Muhammad originally taught and everything to do with what later Muslims, especially under the influence of Greek philosophy, came to believe must be true of Allah if he's to be taken as the uncreated creator of time, space, and matter. In a previous video, I looked at Surahs 42.11 and 112.4, since it's often claimed that those passages trump the vast body of evidence, no pun intended, that the Islamic Allah is a corporeal being, just like he was in the pagan pantheon when Muhammad, in a game of religious duck-duck-goose, singled him out as the only god with whom he'd run around the Kaaba. Having shown that those passages are not contrary to the idea that Muhammad's false god had a body, in this video I'll show that Surah 112 actually supports it. According to Muslim heresiographers, a number of early Muslims are known to have believed that Allah has a body, the upper half of which is hollow, in other words has a mouth and chest cavity, while the lower half is solid, in other words has no stomach cavity or opening in the rear. For instance, the following source tells us about the view of a Muslim named Hisham bin Salim al-Jawaliki. He claimed that what he worshipped is in the form of a man, but without being flesh and blood, that is, like ours, that his deity is made of a diffused white light. He claimed that his deity has five senses and has hands, feet, eyes, ears, nose, mouth. He claimed that his upper half is hollow and the lower half is solid, and that his object of worship has black hair being made of black light, whereas the rest is made of white light. Speaking of another early Muslim named Dawood al-Jawaribi, the same source tells us, he said his deity is a body in the form of a human with flesh and blood, and said his upper half is hollow and lower half is solid, that he has curly hair. However, he claimed it is a body unlike the bodies, and flesh unlike the fleshes, and blood unlike the bloods. Apparently, al-Jawaribi's openness to discuss Allah's body had its limits, for as Ali Shah points out, there were some things that al-Jawaribi wouldn't talk about. He quotes him as saying, Do not question me about the pudendum or the beard, but you may ask me about anything else. If you're wondering what a pudendum is, it refers to Allah's gonads. While we could certainly have a ball discussing Allah's gonads, at this point you're probably wondering what all of this has to do with the actual meaning of Surah 112. In order to answer that question, we need to do a little digging. We need to do the hard work that Muslims, aided and abetted by their imams and apologists, refuse to do. First, to refresh your memory, here's what Surah 112 says, at least according to some translations. Say, he is Allah, the one and only, Allah, the eternal, absolute. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. The words Allah, the eternal, absolute, in the second verse of this surah, represent the Arabic phrase Allahu as -samad. The word samad is what's known as a hapax legomenon, which means it's a word that only occurs once in the Quran. As many scholars have pointed out, the meaning of this word, samad, became increasingly unclear to Muslims after the time of Muhammad and was given more definitions than Muhammad had wives. For instance, Joseph von S., the professor of Islamic studies and Semitic languages at the University of Tübingen stated, between the assertion of God's unity with which this surah starts and the sentence that he has not begotten nor was begotten himself, God is described by a strange and striking predicate, 
a word which is a hapax legomenon in the Quran and has not lost its enigmatic character until today. Likewise, Franz Rosenthal, professor emeritus of Arabic at Yale, stated the following concerning this word. It has a long and varied history behind itself, both in Islam and in Western scholarship, but its meaning has not yet been fixed with any certainty. As well, Dr. Christoph Similitis, who was a senior scholar at Merton and Somerville College, wrote, The meaning of this word is far from clear. In fact, it is a well-known linguistic puzzle in the text of the Quran. One quick and easy way to see the confusion that exists over the meaning of this word is simply by noting the many different ways it's been translated, even by Muslim translators. Yusuf Ali, the Eternal, Absolute. Muhammad Pikthal, the Eternally Besought of All. Wahiduddin Khan, the Self-Sufficient One. Ahmed Ali, the Imminently Indispensable. Ali Kali Karai, the All-Embracing. The Monotheist Group, the Indivisible. Hassan al-Fati Karabula, the called upon. The reason this word has proven to be so problematic, leading later Muslims to assign various meanings to it, is because the original and literal meaning of the word is solid, not hollow, or having no cavity or open space. In fact, that's exactly how it's rendered in the translation of Bijan Moenian. God is solid. This definition and interpretation of the meaning of Samad is borne out by several lines of evidence. For the sake of brevity, I'll just mention three, and you're not going to want to miss the last one. First, according to the science of Quranic interpretation, in order to know the meaning of a given passage of the Quran, one must know the occasion, reason, or causes for which it was given. For instance, in his Uzul at Tafsir, Bilal Phillips wrote, Knowledge of the reasons for revelation is of great importance to understanding the Quran, as well as many of the Islamic laws contained in it. So, what was the occasion or reason that provoked Muhammad to utter the words of Surah 112? According to the Tafsir or commentary of Sayyid Abu Ala Maududi, Surah 112 was Muhammad's response to a question that a representative of the polytheists put to Muhammad. He records the following report. Amir bin At-Tufail said to Muhammad, O Muhammad, what do you call us to? Muhammad replied, To Allah. Amir said, Then tell us of what he is made, whether of gold, silver, or iron. Thereupon this surah was sent down. Maududi records other reports, as do other Muslim scholars, and they all come down to the same basic question. Does Allah have a material makeup? Is he composed of some tangible substance? It shouldn't be hard to see that the translation, which most directly and naturally answers the question put to Muhammad by the pagans, is that of Bijan Mu'inian. God is solid. A second and even more conclusive line of evidence that supports this translation can be found in Al-Tabari's tafsir of Surah 112, where he cites 27 reports that tell us the meaning of the word Samad, the vast majority of which tell us that it means solid, or not hollow. Most significantly, not only do many of the reports go back to early Muslims in whose language the Quran was originally given, as well as to many of Muhammad's closest companions, but he even records a report that goes back to Muhammad himself. According to the following narration, a man named Bereda said, I do not know about this word except that I asked Muhammad, who said, As-Samad is the one who has no hollowness. A third and final line of evidence, which by itself is worth the price of admission, concerns the creation of Adam. Because Allah created Adam in his shape and form, as we've already seen, this created no little confusion for the angels. Even though Allah told them in advance that he was going to make man in his shape and form, when he eventually did so, he first created Adam as a lifeless statue. And when the angels came upon Adam, they couldn't tell the difference between him and Allah, for which reason they were scared. That is, until Iblis, Satan, 
in a stroke of genius, decided to do a little investigating. According to Musa bin Harun, Amr bin Hamad, Asba al-Sudi, Abu Malik and Abu Salah, Ibn Abbas, also al-Sudi, Mura al-Hamdani, Ibn Masud and some other companions of Muhammad, Allah said to the angels, I am creating a human being from clay. When I have fashioned him and blown some of my spirit into him, fall down in prostration before him. Allah created him with his own hands, lest Iblis become overbearing toward Adam, so that Allah could say to Iblis, You are overbearing toward something I have made with my own hands, which I myself was not too haughty to make. So Allah created Adam as a human being. He was a body of clay for forty years, the extent of Friday. When the angels passed by him, they were frightened by what they saw. The angel most frightened was Iblis. He would pass by him, kick him, and thus make the body produce a sound, as potter's clay does. Then he would say, What were you created for? He entered his mouth and left from his posterior. Then he said to the angels, Don't be afraid of that one, for your Lord is solid, whereas this one is hollow. When I am given authority over him, I shall ruin him. In other words, because Adam was hollow, as proven by the sound emitted when Satan kicked him, and by the fact that Satan was able to enter his mouth and exit through his rear, Satan, or Iblis, discovered that it wasn't Allah. Apparently, the Islamic Satan and angels all knew that you can enter Allah's mouth, but you can't get out of his butt. Lord willing, I'll have more to say about Allah's body, including his genitals, but for now, the next time a Muslim tells you that his God is immaterial, timeless, and spaceless like the God of the Bible, do Allah a solid and point them to this video.